Standing here in one of the Wood River Valley's canyons, it's easy to look around and think there's nothing here but bitter brush and sagebrush. But you'd be sadly mistaken. Look at the ground beneath your feet and you'll find an array of gorgeous wildflowers, each with a story to tell. We're lucky we have Kristen Fletcher, the president of the Idaho Native Plant Society, back with us today to introduce us to a few of those magnificent flowers. This beautiful flower uh, is well named. It's called the showy penstemon. And it is just, um, you know, it's, it's 12 to 18 inches tall. It generally grows up on a single stem. Uh, and let me tell you a little bit about penstemons in general. They're called penstemons because they have five stamens, pen stemon, um, but they have what's called an irregular flower. So like a daisy has a flower with the petals going out very symmetrically, but penstemon flowers are very asymmetrical. So that's one thing that's interesting about them. Another thing that's interesting about this particular flower is its um, main name is penstemon, but its second name is cyanus. And so if you think about it, if you're a painter or work with color in any way, think of the color blue cyan. And that's the color um, that gave this particular flower um, part of its scientific name. Now, as we sat here, uh, I was delighted to see that there are two bees that are sleeping in the flowers of this penstemon. There's one right down here with his head directly in, and there's another one right here just hanging on. Here we have a wild onion. Uh, we have many different varieties of wild onion here in our area. They love hot, dry, rocky sites like this, so this little onion is very happy. Um, they uh, usually start out with very thin, narrow leaves. That's what you'll see first. And then they shoot up stalks. Um, and the flower blossoms themselves will be somewhere between white and this brilliant magenta that this particular variety has. Um, uh, all the wild onions are edible. And you can tell if it's, a, if it's really an onion because you don't want to be eating the wrong thing and dying. Um, but you can pick one little flower, rub it between your finger like this, smell it, and if it smells like an onion, it is an onion, and you can eat it. Um, but I will warn you that native foods, um, foods that um, are from wild plants, are very strong. They have very strong chemicals in them. Um, so while if this was a regular garden plant, you could maybe eat the whole flower, uh, with wild plants, you wouldn't want to do that because they're just, they're very strong, um, um, powerful foods. So I was so delighted to see this little goosefoot violet this morning. Um, it looks like a little garden violet, very, very tiny. You can tell uh, it's a goosefoot. There are many different kinds of violets because of the shape of the leaf. Um, ostensibly, it's the shape of a goose's foot. But this little violet tells us a story because in this plant, there are a lot of old dying flowers and yet there are three or four brand new flowers that have come out. Why is that? It's because we had rain and cooler weather. So this plant is usually one of the first plants to bloom in the spring. It's beautiful. And then by this time of year, it's starting to wither and die but it got a nice rain and some cooler temperatures, and it's taking advantage of that opportunity by putting on a whole new crop of beautiful little flowers. My little friend here is a buckwheat, and we have in our area probably five or six different species of buckwheats, um, but they all have certain things in common. Um, they have these, generally, have these kind of spoon-shaped leaves. And you'll notice that this particular leaf is gray. And the reason it's gray, if you had a hand lens or a magnifying glass and looked really closely at it, you'd see it had tiny little hairs um, that grow up and then lay flat against the body of the leaf. And many plants, like sagebrush too, 
um, have little hairs on their leaves. And what those hairs do, they're actually very important. The leaves, uh, the hairs actually shade the leaf and it also helps prevent the water in the leaf from um, evaporating too fast. And since we live in a very windy area, it helps protect the leaf from uh, harsh winds and bright sun. Um, so they're very important. I will say that we call it a buckwheat, but it's not related at all to our buckwheat pancakes. Um, and please don't ask me why it's called a buckwheat. I couldn't tell you. Um, but they're a lovely, lovely little plant and you see many different species of them here in the high desert. So it seems like each year, each spring features certain species of plants. A few years ago, lupin covered the hillsides. People took pictures, remarked on it. It was amazing. This year is the bitterroot's year. And right here, we have a bitterroot. It is the state flower of Montana. And I'll tell you something very special about it. Um, most bitterroot, they're found throughout the Rocky Mountains um, for the most part. Uh, most bitterroot are pink, but in Blaine and Camas County, the bitterroot are white. And it's a special variety of bitterroot that's found only in our area. The plants themselves will look the same, whether you're in the bitterroot valley of Montana um, or down here. But our bitterroot down here are white, where the Montana bitterroot are pink. So uh, it's called bitterroot because the root is bitter. Um, the native folks used it as a food. Uh, they peeled the outer bark and they boiled it. Um, but even with that treatment, it was still bitter. Uh, but it was an important survival food for them when nothing else uh, was around. And it stores very, very well. So they would use it to travel with. Um, it's interesting. I don't know if you can see... Uh, but the buds are this, well, they're almost exactly the color of the dirt here. They're very hard to see. And in fact, if you, if you look around um, on a normal day, you'd think, well, there's nothing growing here. And so sometimes hikers and, and uh, mountain bikers will just ride all over this area. But in actual fact, there's this very delicate plant that's growing here. So this is a very common plant in our area. Matter of fact, our area is sometimes called the sagebrush sea because it's uh, one of the dominant species here. Uh, it's a very common shrub. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, you notice that the leaves are uh, light green. Actually, they're much darker green than you realize. Um, this plant too has little hairs that protect the leaf from uh, evaporation and from the harsh mountain sun that we have. But what I wanted to point out today was you'll notice in this plant that some of the leaves are turning yellow and you might think, well, geez, maybe it's sick or you know, who knows what. But what it is, this is another um, uh, leaf I took from, or a branch I took from the plant. You'll notice that some of the leaves are yellow, but some of the leaves aren't yellow. They're normal sagebrush color. So why does that happen? Well, sagebrush has evolved here uh, for tens of thousands of years, actually. Uh, and they're so well adapted to our wetter springs and our hot, dry summers that it's developed this really interesting strategy. In the spring, it pulls up extra moisture through its roots and it grows uh, extra leaves called spring leaves. But then when the moisture starts to dry out of the soil, it kind of 86s those spring leaves. Um, those spring leaves turn brown and dry up and fall away like that. Um, and it's a way that the plant has to conserve moisture and especially in a dry, dry spring like this, um, it's a very effective strategy. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the wildflowers of the Wood River Valley. I know the bitterroot is one of my personal favorites, even though I think they came up with kind of an ugly name for such a beautiful flower. I'm Karen Bosick with Ion Sun Valley. Until next time, I'm keeping my eye on Sun Valley for you.